You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. And welcome to episode 40 of Shooting the Breeze, the formal gun podcast of WaltNPA.com. I am Walt White, and this episode is about as last minute as you can get it. Uh, as I, I talked last week in the discussion topic about being in a car accident and, and carrying a gun throughout that whole ordeal. Well, uh, I've been without a car for a week. It has been just tr- tremendously stressful dealing with insurance companies and uh, car salesmen. Uh, mostly, not not... Not necessarily car salesmen. Car salesmen's managers uh, had a really interesting uh, visit with a with a car dealer. I got turned over to the manager, and it was just, it turned into a complete frustration after that. Uh, I've been dealing with insurance people, adjusters. Uh, it's just been a, a complete mess, and I actually didn't get around to doing my show notes until today, um, earlier on this morning. It is Monday evening at this point, so we're we're dealing with show notes that I put together a couple of hours ago, and uh, I'll be rolling out this episode tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning. So, uh, just a couple of things before we get rolling into the news. And as always, uh, I am giving away a signed copy of "Shoot Your Guide to Shooting and Competition" by Julie Golub. Um, since we're still in the month of May, head over to waltnpa.com or check out the show notes to this podcast and look for the link to the May May contest post. Uh, click on it, uh, you know, read through the particulars. It's really simple. I ask a, a, a very basic question about firearms. You answer that question. It's an opinion question. You can't get it wrong. And I'll randomly select a winner at the end of the month. Simple as that. Just go take two seconds out of your day and uh, sign up for a free copy, or sign up for a chance to win a free copy. Uh, aside from that, I wanted to do a little bit of an update on the the MagTech Ammo review that I've got coming up. As I mentioned last week, uh, Lucky Gunner was kind enough to send me two free boxes of MagTech uh, Solid Copper Hollow Point in 380. Uh, it's been it's just a really busy week ever since that car accident, so I haven't been able to get out to the range as I would have liked and get this ammo run through the gun and things. Um, I'm going to try to get out this weekend and put rounds through the gun and record everything and try to put a review together. So my apologies for a little bit of a delay there, but you know you've got to understand I'm I'm, I'm without vehicle and uh, it's just been an absolute mess. Uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about before I roll into the news was I got an email, a little bit of a criticism from a listener uh, regarding my 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 comments about uh, Taurus firearms. Um, over the last couple of weeks I've been doing little updates. Uh, it all started when my brother and I went to a gun show in the area. Uh, my brother, uh, uh, a Taurus PT709 Slim, caught his eye. He wound up buying it. A few days later we go to the range and we're having some problems with accuracy. Uh, actually a lot of problems with accuracy. And we were having problems with the slide binding on the barrel and uh, some, some really heavy wear within the first 20 to 30 rounds. So my brother sent it back to Saurus. Uh, he received a confirmation letter that they had it. They gave him a tracking number. And uh, th- periodically he was checking, you know, once a week, looking for information on this tracking website, and nothing was changing. And uh, it was getting really, really close to the four-week time frame that they told him he would have the gun back in. And, uh, you know, throughout the way I was comparing Taurus to Smith & Wesson, with, you know, because uh, I have a... I have a warranty experience with Smith & Wesson. My brother now has warranty experience with Taurus. And I'm sort of just comparing the two. Um, you know, I'm not involved with the Taurus thing, but I'm getting all the feedback from my brother as this thing goes along. And I'm comparing it to the only experience I have, which is Smith & Wesson. Um, a listener said that, it, you know, it's he doesn't feel that it's fair that I'm comparing it to Smith & Wesson. Uh, you know, he's not... 
he's not so he's not supporting Taurus. He's not backing Taurus on this. He says he doesn't have any interest in it. However, he's, he didn't think it was fair to compare it to Smith and Wesson. And on one standpoint, I, I understand where he's coming from. And you know, he makes the argument that that Taurus has provided us with, or tar provided my brother with additional information. You know, this tracking number, this website to check things. You know, and if anything, their customer service should have been better than Smith and Wesson's because of this. Um, um, I, I guess I can agree. T I can agree with that to an extent. My brother was given all this information, but the website's never updated. Uh, it's. I think it's listed as they have received the gun, but they have not added anything to it. So my brother's been completely in the in the dark. Uh, we are now into five weeks that Taurus has had the gun. They promised my brother would have it back in four. Uh, as it was getting really, really close to four weeks. He's not he's not received any information. The website isn't updating. He called back. Uh, I think he escalated the situation to speak with the manager. The manager promised him he would have the gun back today, in his hand Monday. Today. He didn't receive it. Uh, he called Taurus rather angry, and I'm not quite sure what transpired, but they promised that they would overnight the gun and he would have it tomorrow. Um, you know, he's not holding his breath at this point. Uh, they're beyond the four-week time frame that they had initially ex initially told him. Uh, they promised him the gun today. He doesn't have the gun. Now they're promising him overnighted, uh, promising that it would be overnighted. And, uh, you know, it, your guess is as good as mine whether or not it's going to show up. So, um, y you can understand sort of my frustration. I again, it's not my gun, and I probably shouldn't be frustrated about it. However, you know, my brother, being a new gun owner, is going through this this whole ordeal with Taurus, and it's just put a very sour taste in his mouth as his first firearm experience. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of take a little bit of responsibility for that, for recommending Taurus to him in the first place. But that's kind of where we're at with the, the whole Taurus thing. You know, I'll let you know as things move along, you know, if, if I get any more feedback or, or get any more updates on the whole Taurus thing for my brother, I'll be sure to pass them along to you. So, with all that said, let's get rolling into the news. Oh, and by the way, I do really appreciate the email. Uh, I, I even do appreciate the criticism. Uh, it was well written. Uh, he made his points very valid. Um, I agree with uh, a fair portion of what he had to say. However, you know, again, I, I still have to kind of back up my experience comparing my brother's experience with the only experience I have. Uh, may, it may or may not be fair, but it's the only experience I have to to you know compare to. So, all right, the first of three pieces of news comes from Philly.com, and it is entitled "No Hard Feelings for Boyd Jailed Because of Fake Gun." Uh, yeah. I sort of f I feel as though I have to explain myself because this isn't exactly a gun story. Uh, you know, it, it includes the word gun, and theoretically there was a gun involved, even though it was a toy gun. But, uh, I don't know, I guess it's sort of a, like a public school system rant kind of a thing, but just kind of hear me out. After spending 10 days in juvenile detention for an incident involving a toy gun, 12-year-old Gerald McNeil's first meal when he was released Friday was shrimp, mac and cheese, and spinach. Yes, spinach. Gerald, whose favorite color is peach and whose favorite Phillies player is Vance Worley, isn't a typical 12-year-old. The incident that landed him in juvie on a felony assault charge May 8th isn't typical either. Gerald, a tall, thin, quiet boy with long lashes and even longer limbs, had taken a plastic toy gun away from his little brother Isaac, 9, and put it in his book bag because their mother doesn't allow them to play with toy guns. As the boys were walking to school, a 12-year-old girl began to tease Gerald and opened his bag, exposing the gun. Another boy they were walking with grabbed it, and Gerald struggled with the boy to get the gun, to, to get the toy gun back. It, it accidentally went off, and the little girl was struck with a plastic pellet. She wasn't injured, didn't seek medical attention, and didn't even tell school officials about the incident. However, her friend did, and Gerald was taken to the 2nd District Police Station, where he was held in a cell for 10 hours and charged with numerous crimes, including aggravated assault, a felony. Police identified the toy gun, which cost $2.59 at a corner store, as a BB gun and a, quote, deadly weapon, unquote. Gerald was taken to a juvenile facility where he remained until hearing on Friday. According to Gerald's mother... Tina Vasquez, the judge decided that if Ger Gerald goes to school, continues to get good grades, com completes 10 hours of community service, stays away from the girl involved in the incident, and is in his house by 6 p.m. every night for the next three months, his case will be dismissed. But Vasquez still doesn't understand why Gerald was charged with a felony and was held in custody for nearly two weeks. 
As for Gerald, he's nervous now, not the same, he, she said. While sitting on his couch in the Orange Police Athletic League t-shirt Sunday, he tapped his feet and rapidly kept his hands busy with an unopened bag of sunflower seeds. His mother wants to take him to see a therapist. He's nervous to go back to, to Carnell School Monday, Vasquez said. There's already a nasty false rumor being spread among the kids that Gerald was raped while he was in custody. I want to be homeschooled now, Gerald said, because you don't have any distractions or anything. Vasquez, a full-time SEPTA bus driver, hopes to transfer Gerald to another school, but he'll have to remain at Carnell for now. Gerald said he looks forward to high school, and more importantly, to college, where he wants to get a judge degree, a teaching degree, and a medical degree. Then I'll pick out one of out of the three, he said. Meanwhile, despite his own nightmares, Vasquez said Gerald remains a good big brother. When Isaac woke up crying Saturday night, Gerald held him until he calmed down. Gerald said he doesn't hold any bad feelings toward Isaac or anyone involved in the incident. It was just a crazy situation, he said. And, you know, the, the kicker of all this is if you, if you start reading through the comments, there was actually someone that said, well, it's better that the boy learn now with a toy gun than with a real gun in the future. Or, or you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing that this happened now instead of happening later with a real gun. Or, or something along the lines of this would have happened later if it were a real gun. And, you know, it's a good thing it was a toy gun. And, uh, you know, it was kind of one of those facepalm moments. I just, I don't quite understand how all this this went down. Uh, you know, I don't know whether this would actually happen on school property. It says they were walking to school. Um, so I guess if it were on school property, that's where this whole stupid zero tolerance, tolerance policy kicks in. And I just don't understand how a 12-year-old boy that accidentally discharges or negligently discharges a $2.59 corner store, what, what, a Saturday night special from the local, you know, corner convenience store, he, he doesn't even injure this, this little girl. In the whole ordeal, you know, they're being kids. They're they're ref they're wrestling around. They're screwing around, and uh, and a, and a toy gun goes off. And the kid spends ten hours in in custody, and then he spends ten days in juvenile hall. This is just absurd to th to think about this uh, this uh, this whole situation. And my my daughter is is going to be going to public school in in a few years, and and I have to. This is what I think is going to happen, or, or this is what I think I'm, I'm going to have to deal with as a parent. This just absurdity and these just absolutely, absolutely ridiculous zero tolerance policies. They're just, they take away all common sense. And you get situations like this where a 12 year old spends 10 days in juvenile hall and is charged with felony assault charges, and they charge him with assault with a deadly weapon, no less. I'm getting kind of worked up because this is just stupidity at its finest. But there is news item number one. All right, well, news item number two isn't as anger-inducing. Actually, it's not anger-inducing at all. So it should be much easier to get through. But I think that I've discussed this sort of before. Um, this, this particular news article is new, and the... The class that they're talking about is recent. However, I think I've talked about a class that this guy did before. The name just sounds really familiar, and the whole layout just seems familiar. I don't know whether it's like a deja vu moment or moment or what, but uh, this comes out of NBC Montana, and it's entitled "Gun Safety Class Aims to Empower Women." And it says, recently, attention surrounding sexual assaults in Missoula community have many concern for their safety, but one firearm ex expert is offering a class to give women another option of self-defense. One he says will prevent them from being victims. Wendy Huffman is a working mother. She's also a gun owner. I have young kids at home and I own a gun. I do a lot of traveling by myself. I decided that I needed to be extremely safe, she said. Huffman is just one of several women who've gone through the gun safety course for concealed weapons. I was really relieved when I walked in and saw that there were other females excited to learn about gun safety just like I was, Huffman said. Gary Marbutt has been leading the safety courses for more than 20 years. While the class is co-ed now, he said he originally designed it for women. What I really want to do is empower women to be able to enforce their choice to not be, a vi not be victims, said Marbutt. To help with that concept, Marbutt taught the class about self-defense, lethal force, and safety. I think people who want to use firearms for self-defense absolutely should be should not rely on training that comes in the box with the gun because there is nothing there is no training in the box he said it has always been 
my my it has been way exceeding my expectations just just the knowledge that I feel like I'm walking away with today from taking the class said Huffman Marbot said he's graduated about 3,600 people through the course, of those about half of which were women. For more information, click here, and that's kind of the end of the article. Um, there's a video associated with it. If you click on it and view it, it's more or less what I just read. Um, there's some footage. There's a, there's narrative over top of the footage. So, you, you know, you'll see the women uh, sitting in the classroom. You'll see uh, Marbot you know, standing in front of a class discussing self-defense or whatever, it's, you can't hear him talk. Um, you know, and there's some footage at the range, uh, you know, women, different women shooting guns and things like that. Uh, you know, they show you a woman shooting a Glock. And overall, I think this is a really good thing. However, there was, there were two minor issues when I was watching the video. The first thing is there's a, there's a woman who's standing at the firing line and they have a close up of her hand. They must be shooting from, uh, like behind her left shoulder and she's left-handed and you can see her her trigger finger in her hand fairly well and you know she breaks a shot it looks like the gun moves quite a bit in her hand and you know she readjusts her grip which is sort of like teacup style and she's readjusting and readjusting and the whole time her, her fingers on the trigger and I, I just i found myself wanting to scream at the at the computer monitor to get your finger off the trigger but uh you know there was a minor issue there uh you know she fired the next round and all was well uh the other minor issue i noticed was it was the grip being so low um you know not to not to be like a bigot or anything but you know one of the common things i've heard about women shooting is that you know they have less upper body strength it's more difficult for them to manage recoil and you know in in, in the event that you're teaching a class of women I would think that you would want to teach them a more aggressive grip style so that they could manage recoil a little e better um, not to say that they can't manage it with this teacup style grip where you've got your support hand almost wrapped underneath and it almost looks like they have their thumbs like they have one thumb down on the grip and then they're wrapping their other thumb down and around and squeezing which gets just kind of a weird thing going on. When the gun recoils, it, it kind of makes room for your wrists to move. And so, uh, I mean, I'm not an instructor, but that's kind of one of the things that I saw as a competitive shooter. I like having a really aggressive grip. I really like the way it, it, it allows me to manage recoil, and uh, I think it works much better than having wrists that are, are sort of straightforward. When you have that turned wrist in your support hand, I think it really strengthens the grip. And I think teaching women something, a grip similar to that, or maybe that grip, would would help with the recoil but again you know this this class is probably more about uh you know getting females from, or any or co-ed classes in this case familiar with firearms and self-defense information you know what to do if if something happens how to handle the situation and less about technique but that's kind of one thing that caught my eye was was the grip but all in all really good story i'm glad this guy is doing it. it's been doing it for a long time and uh you know he deserves applause for you know for empowering women in the area well, the last piece of news I have is a cold, hard reminder that uh, restraining orders are nothing but a piece of paper and do nothing to prevent crime. This piece of news comes from KXLY.com and is entitled, Homeowner Shoots Intruder. It came down to either me or him. Newman Lake, Washington. A jealous ex-boyfriend broke into the Newman Lake home of his ex-girlfriend's boyfriend's early Sunday morning and was shot and killed by the homeowner. Spokane County Sheriff deputies say a Honeymoon Bay homeowner was acting in self-defense when he shot an armed intruder. Identified late Monday afternoon by the Spokane County Medical Examiner as 43-year-old Sean M. Parsons. Parsons had been served a no contacts served a no-contact several hours prior to the shooting, but that didn't stop him from taking a shotgun and a pistol to Doug Snarsky's Honeymoon Bay home to confront his ex-girlfriend and Snarsky. Early Sunday morning around 1 a.m., Parsons slipped into the couple's home when he started calling out to the couple. All of a sudden, we heard his voice down here saying, Where are you? Come out. That's when she said, That's him. She recognized his voice, Snarsky said. So he grabbed his revolver and stood at the top of the stairs while Parsons detailed his intentions to kill him and his girlfriend. He's go, he goes, nobody gets out of here alive. I've got 24 rounds for my shotgun. I plan on using them all, he said. At that point, 911 dispatchers were on the phone. Snarsky had already dialed them 
and, and listening as he tried to defuse the situation. I'm trying to talk him down. Just leave. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. But he was on a mission to kill, he said. At that point, Parsons fired a pair of shotgun blasts at Snarsky, peppering the top of the stairwell with buckshot. Snarsky decided to hold his fire unless the gunman intended, or, unless the gunman tried to reach the second floor. I just laid on the ground around the corner and watched his shadow come up with the lights. And as soon as I knew he had hit the last step, I just pointed up and let him have it, he said. It was the first time Snarsky ever fired his revolver. Parsons was shot and killed. The spot where he fell now marked by black plastic, which covers the spot where the man bled to death. Snarsky took no pleasure in the shooting, but the damage to the but the damage to rounds of buckshot fired at his bathroom door is a grim reminder that what, of what could have happened if he hadn't defended himself and his girlfriend. Like I said, I played it right to the end. I tried to talk him down. I mean, nobody wants to kill anybody, but it came down to either him or me. He said. And that's the end of the article. My apologies for the, the skipping and just weirdness. The uh, the article is sort of a transcript of the news piece, and it, it got a little jumbled, and it was kind of difficult to follow. But the gist of the situation is, uh, you know, new boyfriend and girlfriend serve ex-boyfriend with no contact papers, basically uh, a restraining order. Later on, I guess the ex-boyfriend gets angry and at 1 a.m. decides to break into the home and takes it a bit further by, you know, calling out for them and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, get in their heads, freak them out. Uh, you know, he's going to kill them and he wants them to suffer. You know, he wants them to know that he's coming to kill them. And, uh, you know, he's got 24 rounds for a shotgun. He's planning on using all of them. And I guess that was his fatal mistake. And, you know, it, it alerted the homeowner who had a, who had a revolver, which... I really wish he had shot prior to this, but it, it all worked out in the end. And, you know, his his uh, his plan, you know, seemed to work really well. You know, get down low, stay around the corner, and just kind of watch the shadow. If he tries coming up the steps, just blast him and let him have it. Uh, the news article makes mention that uh, Snarsky fired left-handed, even though he's right-handed. I guess he was kind of laying around the corner and just kind of watching and waiting for him to, to get this guy to appear above him. And, you know, he just kind of reached up with his left hand and squeezed the trigger. But, uh, you know, bad guy dead. Good guys survived. Not, you know, no serious injuries. No injuries at all from, what, from the way it sounds. But, uh, you know, another you know, psychopath off the streets and uh, no one no one will need to worry about uh, that jealous ex-boyfriend ever again. Well, as I said earlier on, I made the show notes for this episode earlier on today, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to go back and, and dig through a variety of RSS feeds. So I, I looked at the more recent ones. Uh, one of what is quickly becoming one of my favorite blogs is... Uh, when the balloon goes up. So I headed over there. I started looking through some of his more recent posts. Uh, there was one in particular that I saw last week that I thought was really good. So I pulled that one out and I want to talk about that today. And it is entitled Comments on the Differences in Post and Notch Style Sites. And this is in reference to uh, different sites that you're going to find on pistols, uh, primarily semi automatics. And it's, it, it's, really interesting that he steps through different types of sites where you have just a basic black post and notch style site where you've got basically like two little leafs on either side and then you have a black post in the middle and that's you you know you line them up and and that's how you get your site picture um, he talks about uh, different types of three dot sites uh, how they can potentially be a little busy uh, how the dots can get rather large especially if there's like a tritium insert and then there's a a dot around or a, a ring around the insert. Uh, a buddy of mine has uh, night sights installed in his Glock. I think they are True Glow sights or something like that. Or I think they're True Glow. But uh, the the dot is massive. Um, the, I I haven't shot his gun. I have handled it a little bit. You know, pointed it. Uh, just kind of messed around with it a little bit at the range and you know this the dots look great they're really big they're really bright however they just seem humongous uh, I find I have a really difficult time aiming with them because of how dot how large the dots are um, my eyes kind of get lost in that cluster of dots uh, he also talks about the cup and ball style sight that is on the the Glock now Glock has 
the rear sight po the rear sight is u-shaped and it's got this big white bar that's got you know two verticals and a horizontal it makes like a three-sided box and the objective here is to center the the white dot in the front sight inside of this this three-sided box uh, you know it's sort of like centering up the the cup and ball kind of a thing and you know he talks about how it's difficult to to get the dot precisely in the center of this this u-shaped outline and how the rear sight is visually distracting and i couldn't agree more when i got my my glock the first thing to go was the was those sights i couldn't stand them initially i thought you know this is kind of cool it's different you know it's it's uh it's kind of striking you know i like it a little bit better than the three dot style that was on my mp and you know the more I, I was using them the the less and less i liked them i found that that big bright white bar underneath that big u shape outline on the rear sight was just so big and bold that it distracted me completely from the front sight when i was pressing the gun out and trying to get a sight picture i find myself staring or focusing on the rear sight rather than the front sight and i found it to be really really distracting he goes on to talk about stacked stacked style sights where you have a dot on the front sight and maybe a bar on the on the rear sight and you just sort of have to stack them or you have you have a dot and a dot uh, and then he goes on to talk about single dot style sights, which I absolutely love that style sight. Um, I, I, I thought I was going to have a really difficult time transitioning to a blacked out rear sight, but it has just been tremendous. Um, he talks about the benefits of going with something like a Savigny sight, where the the dot in the front is a it's a fiber optic filament, but he talks about the the Savigny sights from Warren Tactical have that fiber optic filament located high on the front post and it makes point of impact a little easier so you don't you're basically the top of the the fiber optic filament is where the bullet is going to go you don't have to you don't have to do like a pumpkin on a post kind of a thing where you're where the bullet is going to impact at the top of the front sight post and not the dot itself and when I transitioned to Warren Tactical Sights, I didn't even realize that the, the front sight post or the, the filament was so high until after I read this post. I went out, I got my gun, and I, I took a look. And the, the, the fiber optic filament couldn't get any higher. Um, it's a nice, small fiber optic filament. It's really bright in the daylight. Uh, being fiber optic it gathers up all that light and it really shines well. And I find that it's just incredibly fast on fairly short range target something like uh you know 10 yards and under it is really easy to get really fast target acquisition with a blacked out rear and that just bright glowing front fiber optic filament on that on that post uh i just i cannot talk highly enough about how much i like these warren tactical sites but it's a really interesting article. You know, it go, again, it goes through different style sites and, you know, talks about them with his experience with these different types of sites and uh, sort of maybe like a pros and cons list of, of each style site. And I found it to be really informative. So head over to When the Balloon Goes Up and check out comments on the differences in post and notch style sites. The second and final piece of featured content comes from JG over at Marooned and has to do with pocket carry. And, you know, he goes on to say that, you know, it's, it's kind of getting around that time of year where pocket carry becomes much more common. Uh, he says that in his area, you know, with with it getting warmer, it's just easier to toss a gun in his pocket rather than have a have a larger gun on his hip with a cover garment. And, you know, it can get kind of bulky, it can get kind of hot, tough to conceal depending on what you're wearing. And... You know, he talks about having a little bit of a bias in the past where, you know, he only wanted to carry guns with a caliber that started in four and ended in a five. And, you know, he wanted to have these, you know, sort of real guns kind of a thing. And, you know, he found that over time, in these warmer months, those bigger, larger guns wound up staying in, at home in the safe. And the smaller pocket guns, you know, found their way into his rotation. And I find myself in a very similar situation. In the winter time, when it's kind of bulky, or when, or even in the fall, where I'm wearing hoodies and things like that, I find it's it's just incredibly easy to to conceal a larger gun on my hip. Um, even in the summertime, when I'm wearing a t-shirt, I really don't concern myself too much with the gun that's on my hip. We're in a Pennsylvania is an open carry state, so if my shirt rides up and and be, and the gun becomes visible, if I'm stretching or reaching, I'm not too worried about it. Um, the only thing I do need to worry about is being hassled by police if someone calls, you know, a man with a gun in. And, uh, and I have a confrontation with, with police. I'm not really too concerned about that. 
Um, again, because Pennsylvania is an open carry state, the most I'll get is a slap on the wrist. And, you know, legally, uh, I shouldn't receive anything, but I may get a verbal slap on the wrist for exposing my gun, which is just the opinion of the police officer and not necessarily uh, an infraction of the law. Or it's definitely not an infraction of the law, not, not necessarily anything. It's not. But um, in the summertime, it's getting warmer. I find myself picking up my, my pocket pistol and slipping it into my pocket more and more. I, whether it's just a matter of, okay, I'm running to the grocery store, I'm going to be out for 10 minutes, or I'm going to be running down to Lowe's, or I've got to run out and, and run an errand you know, for 15, 20 minutes. You know, do I want to slap this, this bigger hybrid holster on my hip and, and get my gun ready and go out? Or do I just want to slip a Smith & Wesson bodyguard in my pocket and forget about it? Well, the... The bodyguard typically wins out. I find myself going out more and more often with this little pocket pistol on me. And I know there are a lot of arguments about, you know, the 380 is an ineffective round and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a mouse gun. It's, not, it's no good for anything, you know, further than three feet in front of you. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of get where you're coming from. Uh, not you necessarily, the person listening to this podcast, but the the people that make that general generalization. I kind of understand where they're coming from to an extent. Uh, however, I'm very comfortable with my 380. Uh, I think it packs enough punch that uh, it it will it will get the job done. I'm not concerned about it being underpowered. Uh, if I was carrying a 32, I'd probably be comfortable with that because. As JG mentions in the article, a 32 is better than nothing. A 22 is better than nothing. Um, I actually had someone argue with me in the past about a comment I made. Uh, it was a quote from uh, the gun store guys. I forget what they're called. But the, the gun grapes guys from YouTube, where the, the older gentleman made a comment of, uh, you know, purchase what you can afford. And he said something like, a high point on your hip is better than a Glock on layaway. And I actually had uh, actually more than one person argue with me that the Glock on layaway was better than the high point on your hip. Because, the, you know, the, I, I still don't understand that logic. But, uh, you know, the, yeah, the high point jams and it's a cheap gun and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, okay, I, I don't have any experience with them. However, I've seen s s torture tests on the gun and while they may be big and monstrous and heavy, they they seem to work pretty well. You know, that gun on your hip, I'd, for some reason, is not as good as the gun locked up at the gun store on layaway as you're paying it off. But whatever the case may be, I really thought this was, this this uh, this particular article was a good reminder of, you know, springtime, summer is approaching, and lightweight pocket carry is going to become more and more appealing to people in warmer climates. And, you know, I just thought it was a good read. So head over to Marooned, check it out, and... That's going to wrap up the featured content for episode 40. Well, it is time for the cigar and drink pairing of the episode. And to be quite honest with you, I don't know what kind of coffee I'm drinking. Um, I know that I picked up a box of uh, Dunkin' Donuts K-Cups the other day. And we were getting fairly low. My wife went grocery shopping last night or the night before and picked up uh, Caribou Coffee. And I was up in the kitchen, I turned the Keurig machine on, I walked out of the room, I was playing with my daughter for a minute, and my wife called in, you know, do you want coffee? Yeah, sure, you know, I'm planning on doing this podcast. So she made the coffee for me, I picked up the cup on my way down here and just started drinking it, and I have no idea what she put in the machine, I don't know whether it's Dunkin' Donuts or Caribou. Either way, both brands are good, I like them both, and, the, you know, the coffee is hitting the spot tonight. The cigar is a monster, uh, it's not particularly long however it is a 66 ring gauge uh, ring gauge is determined by uh, diameter in 60 fourths of an inch so a 66 ring gauge cigar is one or it is is 66 64 so it's one and one thirty second of an inch in diameter uh, the length is four so this is a 466 nub habano the the snub habanos use the same Habano wrapper that is on the very popular Siri V cigars, and when the initial when the initial nub line launched, it was it had this big edgy sort of feel to it, and it was promoted as you know the nub cigars get right to the sweet spot. We cut off all that crap, and you know the cigar starts up right in the sweet spot. You don't have to build to it with you know like you would in these longer cigars, and it really caught on. I drank the Kool Aid quite a bit. I, I enjoyed the cigars quite a bit. I smoked a lot of them. Um, as a matter of fact, I still smoke a fair amount of them. Uh, it, nothing that I've bought recently. I, I got a lot 
a lot of these shortly after they were released and I'm, I'm just getting through the last of them now I probably haven't bought a nub in in more than a year but the 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 standard format which it really isn't a standard format uh, but I I th what I think of as the standard nub size is the 460. It's four inches long, 60 ring gauge. It's still kind of big and bulky in terms of ring gauge, but I, I tend to enjoy them. This one is a bit much. It's really uh, awkward to handle. Uh, you know, it's awkward to get in your mouth and take a puff of it because of how large it is, but uh, it delivers good flavor. It's a really slow smoking cigar. I've been at this for uh, nearly an hour and I'm not even halfway through it. So they're a good slow burning cigar. They provide lots of flavor. You don't get a whole lot of wrapper taste out of them because they're so bulky. I think that makes them a little smoother. Uh, they tend to get a bit warm because of how large they are. So you, you have to take your time a little bit, but the, the flavor is good. The, the, the Habano is more towards medium to full. Uh, plenty of smoke, they, they burn really well. Smoke volume is great, you know, all in all, just a good solid cigar for the money. Um, well, I should say they were a good cigar for the, for the money. Now, over the last couple of years, Oliva has done price increases annually, and they, these are just getting out of control. I saw, I was talking to a friend of mine that, that priced the Nub Maduro in at like eight dollars or something like that in uh, washington dc now now dc is notorious for being more expensive however the there were other cigars more more notable cigars at a lower price point than uh than the nub line so i was kind of turned off when i saw that plus local pricing is just getting higher and higher but if you can get these for a good price, it's definitely worth checking them out. Um, you know, you should be able to get a five pack for like twenty five bucks or something like that, depending on where you're buying them from. Um, however, if you'd like to purchase them from my preferred retailer, and I don't know what his pricing is on these, you'd have to ask him. You can do so by getting in touch with Mike over at Buckhead Cigar in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you can pick up the phone and call Mike at 404-844-0400. Uh, Mike has a website. It's askthecigarguys.com. It's not a retail website. However, it lists all of Mike's newer product stuff that he's featuring, and he'll give you prices on five-pack and boxes. Those prices include shipping, and they're, I think they're very competitive. Uh, in addition to uh, the phone number and email, you can also get in touch with Mike via social media. He's on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus as Buckhead Cigar. So drop Mike a line, you know, ask him about some of the stuff that he's carrying, put an order in, let him know that uh, Walt sent you, and support my favorite retailer and a fellow gun guy. The discussion topic this episode is a video I did on location with Troy Dando of Custom Gun Finishes. Um, over the weekend, I went up to Custom Gun Finishes. I was hanging out with Troy a little bit. I brought my camera, and and we did a little bit of filming inside of his shop, talking about some of the services that he offers, uh, going through some of the steps, or showing you some of the steps that he does in terms of machinery and things like that. And, you know, he shows off some guns. Uh, there are a couple of things that I need to let you that you need to be aware of. Um, I have learned the hard way that when you are filming in front of a, an ultrasonic cleaner that you should not turn the machine on until you're finished talking. Because if you're talking, you're talking about the ultrasonic cleaner and then you demonstrate putting guns into the ultrasonic cleaner and turning it on, you are barely going to be here you're you're barely going to be able to hear anything from the time you turn on the machine until either the camera goes off or the machine stops. And I, I kind of learned that the hard way with this video. So I apologize for the, the segment in front of the ultrasonic cleaner. It is tremendously loud on the recording and there's really nothing I can do about it. I can't go in and remove the audio. I can't, I can't go in and remove the noise. For whatever reason, when you're standing in front of the machine talking when it's on, it doesn't seem really loud, but I guess the frequency really messes with the camcorder and it just comes through hellishly on across the microphone so again I apologize for that um, and, and this is more of for the video people that are watching the podcast uh, there's a lot of showing guns and talking about some of the stuff that you see I apologize for that I really didn't consider the audio side of it uh, you should be able to understand what's going on Troy does a really good job of explaining what he's pointing out to you so if you can't physically see it on the on the screen if you're if you're only doing audio uh, you should be able to visualize what he's talking about and 
Uh, I had a really good time up there. One of the reasons why I wanted to get up was wanted to get up to uh, custom gun finishes because I wanted Troy to use the I wanted him to use his uh, ultrasonic cleaner to clean my Glock. I put I don't know probably 1500 rounds through it through USPSA so far and my gun was filthy. I haven't touched it. I haven't cleaned it and I was going to break it down and start cleaning it the other day and I thought, you know what? I don't really feel like dealing with all these chemicals. Um, my my backyard really isn't usable. I have a side yard that's visible from the street, and you know I don't want to be that guy sitting out in the yard cleaning his guns in in plain view of the street and neighbors walking by and you know kids out playing, and I don't like doing it in the house because I don't have a really good way of getting the the the, the smell of the solvents out of the room, and I tend to get a headache from smelling them. So I thought you know what better way than to to get out of actually doing the cleaning with these harsh solvents then to go up and see Troy and have him dunk it in the in the cleaner which did a really good job my my gun is gleaming and I can't wait to get it all filthed up again through USPSA but again sit uh, I, I, I don't know <laughs> sit back and enjoy a little discussion at custom gun finishes with Troy Dando well, I'm Walt. We're here with uh, WaltMPA.com. I'm here with Troy, the owner of Custom Gun, Custom Gun Finishes, and we're just going to kind of walk through and show you some of the services services that he offers. So, take it away, Troy. Yeah, this is Troy. My name is Troy Dando. I'm the owner of Custom Gun Finishes. We offer several services from park rising to hydrographic dips, which is liquid ink, other known as liquid ink, also uh, Duraco. We offer bluing um, and full gunsmithing services. And uh, like I said, you can see some here of our firearms if you go ahead and take a look down there. And uh, what you're going to see is some of the firearms that are done in uh, the barrel fluting, um, let alone that, slow down, and the uh, hydrographic depths to combine with Duraco. We have several firearms shown here from Remington 700, which is this rifle, to a Mossberg 500 to an M1A, uh, to a Brennan 92, to a Glock. We can also do your accessories, your scopes, and uh, we can combine the Duraco, like you see on this weapon, um, with the uh, hydrographic depths, and also the uh, hydrographic uh, up here and the Duraco um, on this shotgun also. So let us take you for a nice tour on our shop today, and uh, we'll show you all we can do it for you, and hopefully you'll choose custom gun finishes. We also, one of the services we offer here at uh, Custom Gun Finish is the park rising tank. Um, you can see here that uh, this is a great service that we can offer for people who want to restore their firearms from military or older weapons that were park -rised. Is there any benefit to park rising over bluing? Um, well, with the one thing with the park rising, we have to say, Walt, is that uh, this finish here requires a little bit of oil to keep it, you know, to keep the finish uh, nice. But what this does over bluing is gives you that traditional finish for your military firearms or something, uh, you know, more antique. Because okay. sometimes they did this and did not use blue. Right. So it's one service that we do offer. And we offer the gray uh, zinc oxide. Um, and there's magnesium, which is a darker black. This is the grayer finish, but we do not offer at, at this time. Okay. All right, so customer comes in, they want to have, let's say for instance, a, a Glock 17 finished. Well, what, what's the process? What what starts, how does it start and, you know? What we do is basically we, we receive the gun from the customer, we take it, we clean it, disassemble and inspect it, and we'll show you that later on in our uh, ultrasonic cleaner. And uh, after that, then it's, it's, we, this customer selects a pattern. And after they select their pattern, a base color is put on depending on which shade they want their pattern to be. And after that's put on, then we go ahead and dip it in our tank. After that, it's allowed to dry for approximately two days. Then it's clear coated. And uh, all the other parts, depending on which colors they, they choose or combine with the Duraco, um, then we go ahead and reassemble it. And then they're test fired. Um, there is an ultrasonic blasting part of that because uh, guns that come in greasy or, or or actually have heavy wear or pitting or anything, we can basically take apart 75%, take care of 75% of that. But if not, 
We also have a, a coating called DuraFill, which will actually fill some of the heavy pitting um, before we go ahead and, and get to this process. But uh, there's almost 2,000 patterns of this. There's 300 colors of Duracoat, and you combine these colors together and everything else, you have a superior product. And uh, you know this stuff will take three years outside in the weather, pervious to anything. It will not rust, scratch, peel, or um, flake off. And uh, you know we guarantee it. And uh, it's a very, very uh, in-depth process, but it's a very good one. Are there any limitations? Uh, so, for instance, if you're doing a shotgun, can you have hydrographics on the moving parts? The hydrographics are one thing that you do not want to have on your moving parts, say the, the magazine tube. Um, besides that, there's basically no other parts besides the internals that you don't put the hydrographics on. Do the stocks, the barrel, the receiver, um, those parts, your magazine caps, you know, scopes, we can do scopes, you have to sign a waiver. They only spend 30 seconds in here. Um, but besides that, there's basically no other part of the gun that you cannot do. Um, also, we can do uh, other things in hydrographics, whether you know, uh, if you're hunting other equipment like your binoculars, you want to have your uh, knife to match, you want to have uh, the mirrors on your truck done, or your anything that will fit in this tank, we can basically hydrographically dip. And we can just do your stock, and everything else can have Duracoat. You can do one part for your gun or no parts for your gun. Uh, it's, uh, it's an in depth process, and you can combine them together, and it really makes for a superior product. Um, it's the same exact things that all the companies are using, Benelli, Remington, Mossberg, all those companies that are using that to this day. We're trained, factory trained, and licensed by Twin Industries. So we have the factory training, we have their equipment, and uh, we can offer uh, all the patents. So hopefully this one product here will take that old gun that had the wood on it and was just blued, then we can take and use that and convert it into a modern day shotgun um, with all the patterns and everything which you already own. So it doesn't have to be done on a new gun. We can do this on anything. So that's what makes this process totally unique, you know, for us. Right, so after the, the product is dipped, this is kind of what it looks like, right? That's right. So basically we start out with your, your basic stock, whether it be wood or um, composite. We take it, we either blast it, sand it, and uh, use a wax remover and everything to treat it. And then uh, it gets your primary coloring underneath, whether it be a tan, a white, a beige, or a green, depending on what your um, colors may be. And then what we do is we go ahead and dip it. And after it comes out of the hydrographic tank, it's, it's put in a liquid wash for about seven minutes. And uh, after the liquid wash, um, that removes all of the uh, glues, because this is liquid ink. It is thinner than a human hair. And uh, after the liquid ink's on there, then we go ahead and it dries for approximately two days, and then we go ahead and clear coat it. The clear coat is Duracoat, and once that clear coat's put on there, it's permanent. And uh, you can blast it off if you ever choose to change it, but with the Duracoat being in there, it'll never, it'll never fade from the sunlight, it'll never chip off or peel off. We, and that is actually better than what you're getting from the factory, because they're not using a high quality um, top coat, what they're using is basically an automotive product and everyone knows how much our automotive product uh, like on our car will come off. Um, so this is the end product basically and uh, this is what you end up with. You can see the detail um, what you could have with hydrographics which was liquid ink printing. You can find that on our website and all the different patterns. Alright so uh, just a few seconds ago Troy told us about uh, cleaning the guns after they're inspected. Uh, here we have my very filthy Glock 17, Scott's Tactical Cheetah, and uh, we're going to let Troy walk us through the process of getting these guns cleaned. And uh, basically what we do is we take a firearm that's brought in here, we disassemble it, we inspect it. Before it goes anywhere else in this shop it's, it's cleaned in this ultrasonic cleaner. This is a military grade ultrasonic cleaning machine with filtration. So what we do is basically you're going to take and take the weapon, and you're going to field strip it. Now, after you have it field stripped, you're going to go ahead and put it into the cleaning solvent. It's not really a solvent, it's just basically a caustic soda. It will not harm any gun finish, okay? The only thing you don't do is put wood in it, which we disassemble the wood from your firearm before we place it in there. Take your firearm, filthy lock, place it in there. These are weapons 
that were done by us, and you're going to see how the, the hydrographics and the ultrasound holds up to them. These are weapons that are all fired in the, the competition. So we're going to we're going to place them in here. We're going to take them. Place them. We're going to take and turn the timer to 26 minutes at 120 degrees, which is fluid. Now we're just going to leave it in there for possibly 26 minutes. At the end of 26 minutes, what's going to happen is we're going to take the firearms out, we're going to place them here, let them drain, we're going to blow them off um, with just basically shop air. And uh, in their case, they won't need to be lubed in the oil tank, but also for your older firearms and other things, you can take and place it. What we do is after blowing off the shop air, we place it into the hot lube tank. This is a firearm specific lubricant. What allows this to do for another six minutes is to be penetrated into the metals and into the internal parts of the firearm uh, by the ultrasound through the hot fluid. So that's one service we um, offer. This will take the gun and clean it to factory clean condition with no doubt. The guy that has the firearm doesn't want to take the part, but for the guy that has the firearm, um, that's an older model. So this is what we do. And uh, it's very a, a very great service, and it's actually a far better cleaning job than you can ever do with your own uh, cleaning rod at home and traditional cleaning stuff. Here we are at Custom Guns. We want to show you some of the uh, end products on our handguns. Um, like we said, we always go uh, mild to wild. We have something for your traditionalist all the way up to uh, the newest uh, hydrographic patterns, plus um, some of the totally custom patterns for anyone else who would like a firearm in that manner. We have basically here a Colt Delta Elite that was fully customized with uh, your serrations, beaver tail grip added, cut back ejection port, your night sights, um, uh, beaver tail grip, lanyard loop added, trigger job done, um, plus a blacked out finish where we took a nickel plated gun and blacked it out on the top and go ahead and left your nickel on the sides and in your grooves. Gives you a two tone kind of nice pattern. Here um, we have like I said our uh, our uh, Beretta 92 which has our dip and combinations of the different Duraco and some night sights put on and actually we have uh, for your guy that you know wants all the new uh, digital stuff to go ahead so is uh, you know basically his perch or his purse matches the shoes and then you have um, here for um, our totally a uh, customer that wants something totally customized. This is a Hello Kitty gun. Um, it's a work in progress. It's not finished yet. But this is a pink gun um, done with the pearl essence over the top of it. I don't know if the video will do it justice. And also with the Hello Kitty scheme. Um, so, you know, whatever you want, mild to wild, right here at Custom Gun Finish. Well, Troy, thanks for you know, taking some time today and yep. showing us what you do, the yep. services that you offer. I really appreciate it. Yep. Walt, I appreciate you coming by and we hope to see from your customers out there and uh, we hope this video goes out to people and they can appreciate some good quality work to guarantee. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video with Troy of Custom Gun Finishes. Again, I, I really apologize for that, that really loud and annoying buzzing coming from the ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, there was some really good information there. I didn't want to cut it all out. I cut... Uh, I cut a good chunk of information out of the end uh, that, that I was just kind of getting a headache listening to the, the ultrasonic cleaner after a little while of editing. And uh, I just kind of dumped some of the information at the end. Uh, basically, I toward the end, the part that I cut out was I asked Troy uh, if someone didn't want to use the ultrasonic cleaner or, or it wasn't uh, an option for them, you know, maybe they had some custom Duracoat work done and uh, they didn't want to ship the gun out just to have it cleaned, you know, can you use, you know, standard cleaners on Duracoat? Will it hold up? And uh, he said that 
you know, Hoppy's number nine, uh, things like that. They're all perfectly fine on on Duracoat. Uh, the only thing that he recommended you do not use is Gun Scrubber because it is very aggressive and it has a tendency to to damage, I guess, the top coat that they put on. Um, aside from that, you, you know, he said this stuff is is really durable and you know any gun cleaning solvent they use at home, aside from Gun Scrubber, is going to is not going to damage it in any way. Uh, I also talked to him a little bit about pricing, uh, and he was talking about. Uh, how many guns will fit in the tank and you know he does like bulk discounts if you bring in a bunch of guns you know he'll drop them all in the tank for you and you know I'll give you a nice round number rather than charging you per firearm and things like that so there was some information that I cut out again because of that annoying buzzing and I apologize for that um, I would like to do some more video with Troy in the future uh, a more laid-back kind of a video talking about how he got into the business um, how his business has progressed uh, less about the services that he offers and more about you know how he's come up in the industry and how he's gotten how he's going from you know doing one or two guns on the side to having a a, a shop that's just packed to the rafters with customers guns that need to be finished and uh you know the the progression that he's gone through in in building the business i think that would be really interesting troy's a troy's a really interesting guy he's into uh, long range shooting you know he shoots uh, clays things like that and he, you know he's a, he's a really interesting guy he's he's really big in the firearms you know aside from just finishing them he actually goes out and shoots them and he shoots quite a bit so he, he's a really interesting individual i want to i want to get him one again in the future and talk more more about him and less about uh, some of the services that he offered so that is your discussion topic for the episode again I apologize for the the buzzing but i hope you i hope you were able to take some worthwhile information out of that despite that noise that annoying buzzing i'm kind of it sounds like a broken record. I keep apologizing for that. Well, it's about time to close out the episode, but before I do that, I want to thank you for listening, downloading, watching, subscribing uh, to episode 40 of Shooting the Breeze, the formal gun podcast of WaltNPA.com. If I've said something that you think is outright wrong or something that you'd like to, to comment on or just talk about, you can get in touch with me in a variety of ways. Again, as I mentioned earlier on in the earlier portion of the video, I don't, I really don't mind criticism. Uh, you know, I really appreciate that email pointing out, you know, me being unfair with Taurus, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to get upset if you send me something like that. I really do appreciate the feedback. Um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is to head on over to my blog, which is waltnpa.com, and click on the contact link. It'll open up a page where you can just plug in some information into a couple of text fields, hit enter, and it will email it to me. Um, if you would much rather use your own mail client, you can uh, open it up, type in walt at waltnpa in the, in the two line, fill in a subject, put in your email. You can even attach uh, MP3 files or video files if you would like those included in the podcast. And I'll review them. And, you know, if they work out, I'll get them in the podcast. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. Um, I'm a big social media user. I'm on Twitter as at Walt W. I'm on Facebook and Google Plus as Walt White. And I also have a Facebook page for my blog where I post gun-related uh, items, mostly USPSA updates, things like that, that don't really make it into the podcast, more blog-related content, gun stuff. Uh, if you type Walt NPA into the search bar in, in, in Facebook, you'll find it. Click like and you'll start receiving updates. Every time I post something to the page, you'll get a little update or you'll see it pop up in your timeline, I should say. I'm also on the Gun Rights Radio Network forum. I have my own Shooting the Breeze subsection where I post a new topic for each podcast released. If you'd like to comment there, please feel free to do so. And uh, speaking of the Gun Rights Radio Network, they're still in need of donations. So if you've got a couple of bucks that uh, you wouldn't mind letting go of, uh, head over to the show notes, click on the donate tab or the, the the contact information for Gun Rights Radio Network. It will direct you to a donate a donation page where you can contribute a couple of bucks to the you know to keeping the lights on over at the Gun Rights Radio Network. Uh, that's going to pretty much close it out. Uh, after you get done listening to the Pine podcast, you know, while you're checking out the Gun Rights Radio Network, anyway, uh, look at some of the other podcasts that are on there. I really enjoy the Gun Dudes. Uh, I really enjoy the Gunfighter Cast with. Uh, Daniel and John. Uh, I also like uh, Bob Main's uh, Handgun World Show. Uh, Bob's, I believe it's Bob, or no, it's Paul. He does the, uh, the Politics and Guns podcast, which is uh, really interesting. He talks about uh, gun-related politics and news items, and he does a, a multi- in multi-release format, I, I believe he does three half-hour episodes each week. Uh, I, I think uh, I remember reading something on the forums where he's going to condense it into a one one-hour show once a week to make it a little bit easier on him. But uh, 
he produces a lot of good content, talks about things that I wasn't even aware were going on, and it's a great way to keep up with the, the, the politic, you know, the guns in the in the political sense, you know, what's going on in different states and across the nation, things like that. I'm also a big fan of the Pro Arms podcast. They've been really slow to come out as of late, but uh, when they do, it's, it's really good information and well worth checking out. Uh, I'm also a fan of the Road Gunner podcast and many others on the Gun Rights Radio Network, so head on over, look through the list of podcasts and find one that you like. There are a lot to choose from, uh, from a wide variety or wide range of topics, and uh, that's going to do it. So again, thank you for checking out episode forty of Shooting the Breeze, and I will catch you next week. You can hear Gun Rights Radio Network on Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher allows you to listen to your favorite shows directly from your iPhone, Android phone, BlackBerry, or Palm phone. On demand and on the go. Don't have Stitcher? Download it for free today at Stitcher.com or in the app stores. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Gun Rights Radio Network shows can be found under sources.